Welcome to the Startup Grind. How did that feel? Great. It feels wonderful. Wonderful to be here. So here at Startup Grind, we do things a little bit differently, and we like to get to know uh, what made you an entrepreneur, and we like to go way back to when you were uh, a little girl, and, and if you can think back that far and, and tell us, what was, uh, what was your, uh, what was your early, early life like? Well, I, um, I was born in Nashville, raised in Nashville, Tennessee. I have uh, 11 sisters and brothers. My parents were, um, my mother had a little bit of college, my father had a GED, and they were low, we were a low income family with two hard working parents. And uh, I remember one of my earliest memories is uh, having a ready made football, baseball, basketball, any team you want it, right? When there are 12 of you, you can play any game without going to look for neighbors. So always being busy and having a lot of fun. But I was very conscious of the fact that even though my parents worked all the time, they were both, that we were poor. I was very conscious of that fact. And uh, especially in Nashville, I'm growing up in the early 60s. And there were still so many vestiges of discrimination uh, there. I remember um, one of my memories when I was younger is that there were two entrances to the YMCA. And uh, when the laws were changed and you could not provide a colored and a white entrance, they whited over the word colored entrance, the words colored entrance. They painted over it in white so you could still see it. So if you knew your place, you would still use that entrance, right? So those are the kind of uh, subtleties that um, you wouldn't think someone who's still living. <laughs> you, you know, you think people have to be in their 70s eight, and 80s to have experienced some of the things that we experienced. But uh, I, I remember being very conscious of the, the racial divide. That's interesting. Like you said, that's what I was thinking when you were talking about it. I've never, I've read about, I've seen that stuff on TV mm -hmm. and heard about it, but I've never talked to somebody who experienced that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think that impacted you in your life? Oh my life? God, very much so. So my father uh, was uh, one of the smartest people I've ever met. He was a custodian in the school system, he, and he was a photographer. And on the weekends, he was a custodian at churches. So he had a day job, a night job, and a weekend job. And that really impacted me, just seeing how hard he worked. And my mother did, she's just an awesome person and an awesome mother. So she did a great job raising us, feeding us, taking care of us all the time. I, I, can, I have very few memories of my mom lying down, you know, not moving. One of my memories waking up is hearing the washer and the dryer and smelling food because she always cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, from scratch. So. Uh, it, it was a really good, really great upbringing. Yeah, it sounds nice. Mm -hmm. It was nice. It was, uh, it was an idyllic because when I was uh, growing up, uh, and, and I laugh at it now, but I, I think I was probably close to grown when I realized that a twin bed was called a twin bed because there were two of them, small. I thought it was called a twin bed because two people slept in it. <laughs> <laughs> Twins were supposed to sleep in it. I, I didn't know because that was the only experience I had had. <laughs> Did you have any entrepreneurial aspirations or people who inspired you as a young woman? As a young woman, my inspiration was to have money, not to be an entrepreneur. I knew that I wanted to have control of my own finances. When I grew up, uh, it was very traditional. My father worked outside the home. My mother worked sometimes. Uh, when she could sneak out because my father didn't even believe in his wife working even though he had all those kids and he was working three jobs he didn't want my mother to work at all which is fascinating to me but uh, but what I remember is that when she wanted something or we needed something she had to ask and uh, that stayed with me I remember saying when I was in junior high school I'm never never going to have to ask my husband 
or anyone, you know, for money. I'm really going to set it up so that I have my own money. So that was, uh, that, that, that's with me to this day, to this day. And uh, because women in the family advocate for their children. They know more about what their children need, even with as many kids as my mom had. She knew what each of us needed. So the things that she saw, just like women today, mothers today, uh, my father didn't recognize as, as real needs. So she really had to, uh, I used to say, oh, grateful husband, Carla needs a coat. May we please buy a coat? You know, that's how it looked to my young self, you know? And uh, that definitely inspired my work ethic. And when you thought about having control of your finances and, and money, what, what did that look like when you were, when you were thinking about uh, it didn't look like what it looks like now. To be honest, at that time, it just looked like being able to support my mother and give her, you know, everything she needed and wanted. That's really what it looked like. Um, it looked like graduating from college because um, in those days, education was preached as the only way for, you know, financial um, independence. You know, you had to be educated. So the need to acquire any type of independence or wealth, education is just the obvious. So that definitely inspired uh, me. Now when I, when I was uh, a senior in high school, I wanted to be uh, an attorney or a writer, but I asked my guidance counselor what major paid the most money without getting an advanced degree. And because of the, when I asked her, she said a doctor or a lawyer. But I said, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time to become a doctor or a lawyer because you have to go to school after college. Yeah, I said, what, you know, what's the next one that you don't have to go to school? And they said, engineer. And that's how I decided to major in engineering. <laughs> Which sounds crazy to me now because I didn't have any particular talent for engineering. I, my last grade in uh, high school, geometry had been a D, and I majored in engineering. Wow, what do you, what do you, think, that, uh, what do you think the lesson is to draw from that? Uh, that you could do anything if you really put your mind to it. You know, I, I think of a, per, a, diff, a particular type of person. Uh, when I was younger, I thought of a different type of person, a particular type of person, a technical person, a math person going to engineering. But when I was in school, I realized that the kids who were really successful were not the smartest ones. They were the ones that were really grinding, really making sure they did what they needed to do and really determined to get out of, out of school. So. And as a, as a young woman or as a child, did you have any entrepreneurial experiences? None. None. I had my first job at 13 um, in a medical records office of a hospital. And I knew everybody's business that I knew because I looked up everyone's files. <laughs> I heard that doesn't work so well today. You can't do that anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad knowing what I know. But um, and, uh, and you know, I worked summer jobs. But uh, when we were growing up, working for a large corporation, you know, working for a General Motors and driving a big car, or working for a General Electric, or you know, any large company was uh, Nirvana. So that's what we, we would strive for, to work for corporate America. When did you get those first thoughts about owning your own business? The first serious thoughts were after uh, spending years in corporate America and seeing how many things could be improved upon. Uh, large businesses have to do things that are not necessarily best for their customers to keep their bottom line, especially if you're, if you're supported by investors, right? You have to keep that profit coming in at all times. Uh, as a result, uh, the consistency of service, the care, the values can get lost uh, along the way. And when I saw the service end of sales, because almost anything that's sold, unless it's uh, disposable. It needs to be serviced at some point. And when I realized how little service there was out there for customers, that those were really my first uh, entrepreneurial tendencies. I, I call myself a gap finder now. 
because over the years I've realized that I can, I can see, see what's missing and, uh, and there is opportunity in what's missing. And what kind of business did you, did you think about when you were having those early thoughts? Oh, I actually had a, um, <clears throat> my first entrepreneurial experience was uh, after I was married and had kids. I had a resale clothing, um, a mobile resale clothing called the Children's Clothing Circle. And I would take all these clothes to uh, someone's location and do parties and sell clothes and eat and drink uh, children's clothes. And I loved it. You know, I loved shopping for the clothes, I loved mending, I loved everything about it. But it was uh, very laborious and uh, not very profitable yes. because uh, people didn't look at, like right now, buying used clothes is a big deal. You know, people do that. People who can afford other things do that, right? It's much more involved now than it was then. But, um, so that was really my first time registering a company, getting a logo, you know, all those uh, exciting things. And over time, I've done other things. I, in the 80s, I had a, uh, no, the 90s, I had a uh, web TV, an internet business, oh, wow. where we actually sold um, web TVs when everyone didn't have the internet. And uh, sold it to some schools and showed people what the internet was, which was, uh, was really interesting. And that was while, you know, I was working my regular engineering job when I was doing those things. So they were just really tiresome, not profitable enough. I, I was too dedicated to my nine to five, you know, to do a good job on a, a side gig. So um, they were tough, but, but they were fun. And I did recognize that I had a, a, a need for something that was outside of uh, just working for anyone. And when did you decide and how to address that, that need you felt? The, uh, when I finally decided to address it in a big way was when I was working for Corporate America and there was nowhere else for me to go. I didn't uh, want to leave Detroit. I wanted to stay here. I was working for a large engineering company and uh, there was no path for me. That I'm not, uh, I don't, I did not and do not have the, the physical characteristics, the ethnicity, the gender to be promotable or particularly successful with the company that I was at. But I saw enough um, opportunity in, in what they did in servicing the equipment and the technology that they sold to know that I could, I could be successful at it. So you just, you just quit your job and start a business? No, I didn't. I actually um, wrote a proposal and um, prayed, wrote a business plan, and then I called up the vice president of uh, one of the company, one of the business units, and said I'd like to come to headquarters in, in uh, North Carolina and talk with you about a proposal. And they said, uh, well, what is it? And uh, I didn't give them any information about it. But I, I flew to headquarters and met with uh, three people. And my proposal was, you all sell to utilities, right? And you don't, I don't think I said you don't do a particularly good job of service, but my customers really knew me and my brand, but they knew the corporation. A lot of people didn't have the technical capability to deal with the products that we were dealing with. So instead of um, buying everything through this large company, I'll quit my job. I will be the face of this company. I have the technical capability and the relationship with the customer, and I'll be the distributor, which means utilities will buy from me instead of from you. That serves their strong desire to diversify their supplier base and it serves your need for uh, technical skill and talent to represent your products. So they actually, uh, I asked for a $50,000 loan from the company. I asked for zero interest, uh, of course. And um, I asked that, uh, just some minor things, like they pay me the same thing that first year that they would normally spend to operate an office. And I paid the loan back like in six months. And uh, the rest is history. 
Wow, so they, they accepted. They accepted it. The interesting thing is uh, I really was, uh, I, I prayed so much as I was writing my business plan, but I made sure that the business case made sense. There was no real downside for them. There wasn't the level of risk to them or to me that most startups would have, right? That was a, a product that I, you know, their product and a um, industry that I knew very well. So actually when I sat down at the meeting, then we, I gave them the proposal, I talked it through, and interestingly enough, they said no. They said no. Why would we do this? And uh, a company with very few minorities of any type said, well, what are we going to do when the other minorities want to quit their jobs and do this? Really? And uh, I said, you evaluate the business case. That's what you do in business. And uh, when I left, they said no. And as um, I knew one of the executives, and we went to lunch afterwards, and when we were eating lunch, he said something, and I knew, I knew it was going to work then. He said, what if we did do this? And he started asking questions about it. I said to myself, oh yeah, this is going <laughs> to happen. And uh, when I got on the plane, I was so frustrated because the business case was so good. Um, I was so frustrated that I actually cried on the plane because they, I had uh, received an official no. But I said, and I really believe this. Sorry about that, you guys. I really believe this. I said, it's not your money. It's God's money. And if he wants me to have this money, I'm going to have it. And I really, it took about two months after that um, before I was able to start my own business. And the, the, funny, the other thing that was funny is they, one of the guys wanted to provide a way out so that I could come back to the company when this failed. And he says, we'll just put in the contract where you're paying the money back, but if you want to come back. I said, don't, don't put it in there. I don't need that in there. <laughs> which I don't know what I was thinking. Wow. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was good. That's a very unique story. I don't think I've ever heard anyone have that approach to starting a business that I've heard before. What, uh, what gave you the idea for that? Uh, I was familiar with the product, the problems, and the desires of the customer. So, um, you know, in, in the utility space, and we were selling equipment to utilities, there's not a lot of room for supplier diversity because most of what they buy are fuel, and large power equipment. And there are not a lot of companies that produce fuel and large power equipment, particularly of any, any type of diversity. And remember, we're talking about uh, the year 2000, which means it was even, the landscape was even less diverse than it is right now. So um, that's, that's how I came up with it. It just made sense. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And were you, how were you feeling when they, when they eventually said yes? Oh, it was, uh, I wanted to be afraid. I wanted to be frightened. But I remember <laughs> saying, something is wrong because you're not scared. You know, I worked for a company for 18 years. And this is, you know, I went to college to be able to work for corporate America. And now I'm about to walk away from it. And uh, I kept saying, you should be frightened. You should be frightened. But I was so excited. Um, I, I wasn't frightened at all. My husband was not very happy. <laughs> not very happy but uh he 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 grew into appreciating it what do you say to people in the audience who want to start a business there they have that that desire and that need that you felt and and they're not sure what to do next i remember feeling like if i didn't start my business i was going to die i mean and that sounds so dramatic right my daughter would say oh my i really felt that i had to start my business but what i'll say to anyone is as, as exciting and as much fun as it's been to run my own company, there is nothing like getting a check every two weeks for sure <laughs> from someone you don't even know and knowing that it's going to be there. When it, it's so different than having to make sure the money is there. So really appreciate you know, the ability to, to make a good living for someone else. The other thing is I was blessed because uh, the company I worked for was very, they were so professional and precise as an engineering company that I learned how to do things a particular way that allowed even my small company when I first started to look very, have a very professional look and feel. 
And, that, and that's important because you want to be able to, when you have a business, you don't want to go into business as necessarily the lowest price. Quality is important to everyone. Everyone wants to purchase the best quality that they can. If they can do that at a low price, that's better. But the quality has to be there. How many of you all have purchased like 20 iPhone chargers over the last few years? Isn't it the most annoying thing in the world? What is up with the iPhone chargers? <laughs> Seriously, it just pisses me off every time I think about it. It works here, and then I move it to another outlet and it doesn't work, or I move it to my car. So, and I want to pay $5 for an iPhone charger, right? <laughs> but, uh, but actually, the $30 ones don't seem to work that much longer than the other ones. But yeah, quality. People want the highest quality they can possibly afford. So um, that's just, just really important. What was your biggest challenge then after so two months after they said they said no, then two months later they said yes, and then you're in business. What was your oh, this immediate is a challenge? Good one. My biggest challenge was I grew up under the corporate umbrella. So I actually thought that it costed, remember this is 2000, I actually thought that it costed 550 to send a FedEx package, right? <laughs> you know, all of my estimates were based on what a $60 billion company paid for it. When I got out and realized I didn't pay the same thing for phone, fax, packages, UPS, anything. I was totally wrong. So I did the business plan based on what I knew at the time. And all I knew was I didn't even realize how expensive insurance was. I had been paying, you know, $100 for insurance. And my insurance went up to like $400. I'm like, what? So just, just having, uh, not having the uh, realistic independent business perspective uh, about what the marketplace was like was my biggest was my biggest challenge and did you have execution challenges right away too where you needed to, to deliver not as much as you would think because when I left um, I had uh, at the time I was in outside sales of uh, large equipment and my inside person left with me so she was my um, my first employee, and, and she's still with me today. So we had the processes, and uh, we knew how to set up the systems. And so much of what we did was relationship. You know, we already had the relationships with the comp customers. There are not a lot of utilities, right? So we know the utilities, we know what they buy. So it really was less challenging than most startups would be. My real ch challenge came in 2008 when everything changed, right? Our business was based on uh, building equipment. And if no one is building, they don't need transformers, they don't need power circuit breakers, they don't need cable, they don't need SCADA systems. So when the bottom dropped out, uh, my biggest challenge was not, not responding quickly enough, expecting a quick recovery, which I think everybody in the country mm -hmm. expected a quicker recovery. So uh, in 2009, I went from about maybe 11 employees to one, one, I almost said one paid employee, mm -hmm. one employee, me. Oh, wow. and, uh, and had to start rebuilding. But we had been following um, some energy legislation and knew that energy efficiency was going to be um, driven by the replacement of the energy infrastructure and um, climate change and other things. So we knew that this was going to happen. And when Public Act 295 was passed in 2008 requiring utilities to decrease the uh, amount of energy that their current users actually uh, consume, then that was our opening. And uh, we had, so we transferred, we moved from a equipment delivery company to an energy services company. And it's, uh, it's uh, actually a much better fit for my passion and my talent because uh, energy is such an economic driver and it's important to every single person and industry. So uh, there's always room to, to talk about energy efficiency. No, I mean, a situation like that, you know, it's one of these events that maybe a few people saw coming, but, you know, we might even be in one of those situations right now. What do you, what do you say to business owners when when they're in a situation and they're thinking my business might you know, drop 90% in the next oh. year or two, 
I think we'd all go to bed if we thought my business might drop 90% in a year or two. And, and the, the, the good and bad thing was that it was so gradual, right? It happened really quickly, and we kept expecting it to recover. And, uh, and it never did. It just got worse and worse and worse. The bad thing about that point, too, was no one had money. No one was being financed. You know, there were no industries except maybe security and, uh, you know, no one was growing. So the, the compression of the, uh, the global economy was so tough because there was nowhere to go. You couldn't go to another industry and say, oh, I, I think I'll make my money here. Um, what I will say is always know what's next. The only thing to say me from going out of business, my company, was we had already started to retool and look at the opportunities in energy efficiency. If we had been totally flat-footed, um, I we wouldn't, would not have even been able to hold on to, uh, to retool. So the, um, the importance of always knowing what the global trends are, what the local trends are, what people are doing on the West Coast and in other countries, Believe it or not, almost anything you do, it's, uh, it's good to know what else is going on in the world because it helps you to establish what's next. I know the next two or three uh, opportunities that I want my business to grow into over the next uh, five to ten years. So you're ready. <laughs> I'm not ready, but I know. <laughs> I at least know where to look. You know where to look, and and as I said, en energy is just fascinating, and it's always changing. And uh, we tend to make decisions about opportunity based on what's going on right now. And if you're doing that, it's too late. You can't base it on what's going on right now and what you see here. You have to see, you have to be able to have some type of a vision for what you expect to be next, and you need to tweak it. It always needs to be tweaked but you always need to be looking to see what's next. And I think you said uh, early on you went from, from a big corporation to your own business and you had some learning. How, how did you learn the things that you didn't know? The hard way, <laughs> consistently, consistently. The uh, biggest lesson that uh, if I looked at my, I was 40 when I started my business, 42. And the one thing that I didn't have a real appreciation for is the value of relationships. Uh, you know, we used to say the good old boy network. It doesn't matter what network. Any network is better than trying to do it alone. Whether you're collaborating to supply a product or a service, or whether you're being collaborative in purchasing or collaborating to discover what your customers need. Relationships are, are everything. I would, the, the main thing I would do would be to cultivate deeper relationships with people who are different than me. We all tend to cultivate relationships with people who think like us, look like us, go to church with us, work with us. And uh, there you just have varying degrees of yourself you know, in your life. When you cultivate relationships with other people, you get a much broader world view of, uh, of everything. And you are able to determine gaps and trends and what's next and know what people are really thinking without just your, your narrow purview. That's a good point. And uh, so that seems like from a strategic level, you know, connect with people who are different from you. Do you have any tactics on how to execute that? It seems like it can be hard to go into a room of people who are very different and, and engage with them. It is hard. So number one rule is be uncomfortable. That's, there's no way to do it unless you're just a, a really outgoing, narcissistic knucklehead. If you walk into a room of people who are very different than you, then there's a level of discomfort. So you really have to just decide that you're going to be uncomfortable. Luckily for me, I started in engineering a white male field in, 19, in the 80s. So discomfort was just part of my everyday life. And uh, it was a just good proving ground for me. Uh, number one is be uncomfortable. Number two is go places you wouldn't normally go. 
so a few years ago when I was trying to find out what was going on in, engine, in energy, I actually bought a ticket to a utility um, meeting that was held at a country club in New York. And if I tell you there were no people younger than 45 and there was probably one other woman in the room and they were talking high level, you know, what's going on in the utility industry. Um, I, I love to say that sometimes you have to buy your way into where the information is. Because uh, when we have the perspectives that we have just based on our experience, we don't know what's being planned next. We don't really know what's going on, what's being planned five years and 10 years down the road. But if you look at what's going on in Detroit, you realize that some of the things that are going on now were planned five years ago. They were planned 10 years ago. We would buy property in different places. We would do many things differently if we had knowledge. So you have to go to where the knowledge is. The other thing that's interesting to me is we don't even know when we live our everyday lives, you know how they say be in the room. What I learned is even with the utility industry, I didn't even know where the room was. You know, I had no idea what city the room is, let alone the building that the room is in, right? So you have to have some connection or some level of engagement to see who's really making the decisions. It's rarely the mayor, right? It's rarely the person that you think it is. It's, uh, you have to understand what the dri what, what's driving whatever momentum is going on in the environment that you want to be in. So just the amount of intelligence that it takes. The benefits that I'm reaping right now are from work that I did five years ago. I mean, there is no easy way. So longevity in business is a big deal. If people see you twice, they don't remember you a year from now. If they see you 10 times, they remember you. If they see you 20 times and there's an opportunity, they may even pick up the phone and call you, right? So it is about the depth of, of relationships. And I think you've been on a few boards. Is that one of the areas that you thought would connect you with other people or get you out of your comfort zone? Oh yeah, the first, uh, one of the first boards I was invited on that took me out of my comfort zone was Invest Detroit. These are um, investment bankers, CDFIs, venture capitalists, and just the vocabulary, totally foreign to me. But they wanted someone who had a small business background. And I didn't think I was gonna be of any value to them because they invested in businesses. But they had never, well some of them had, most of them had never operated small businesses outside of the tech or finance world. And um, I was really, uh, I was really uncomfortable when I started on that board. I'm actually on the Michigan Gaming and Casino Board right now, which is really interesting as well, uh, because uh, the intricacies of running casinos and the way a casino changes everything about a city, how a city operates, it complicates everything for all kinds of reasons. So uh, boards have helped me, relationships have helped me to get on boards. Boards have helped me to enhance those relationships and just learn so much more than you know, just my organic environment. But business is business. And no matter whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit business, the same things matter. You know, doing the right thing, which it, I always say, uh, having some integrity, uh, knowing what's right, having some vision, identifying gaps, seeing what's next, uh, and just trying to be the best person that you can be. Those things count. And when you were trying to be the best person you could be over the years, did you have any like huge breakthroughs, things that you changed that, that had a outsized impact? You know, when uh, about five years ago, I was, uh, we were in the energy efficiency business, and we, put in a proposal with a major utility for a large bid. Got a phone call and said, guess what? You guys won. You all had the best proposal and we're gonna reach out to you in a couple of uh, weeks to start a negotiation. I waited and waited and waited. I never got that call and this was a multi-million dollar award. After a lot of investigation, I found out that someone else had received the award. And the reason 
that I finally uncovered was that they had a better relationship with that company. And as I said, that was about four years ago, maybe five, but I remember saying to myself, oh, it's because you all don't know me. I said, I have a four-word business plan. Y'all gonna know me. <laughs> and I have really kicked up just my presence being out there. I started trying to speak more. I started applying for pitch contests and awards and just really being the face of my company. Because before that, it was nose to the grindstone, work hard, people will respect you, and business will come your way. No, little girl, that is not how it works. So uh, really uh, upping my profile so that people know me as a person. People like to work with companies that are really large, but for the most part, people like to work with people that they want to work with. And uh, some of it is someone saying, gosh, you've been out here a long time, you've done a great job, why don't we look at doing this together? And we're finally at a point now where we get calls from, uh, we got a call from Nevada today, uh, a utility in Nevada, and they said, why don't you bid on this, uh, this opportunity that we have here? So all that work, uh, all those meetings that you go to, all of that networking that you just get sick of looking at different people, it takes time for it to pay back. But uh, if you are steadfast, if you maintain integrity, if you do what you need to do, and if you meet the right people. Business is all about people. It really is. It seems like that's been a thread throughout your life where, where you've been grinding at various stages. How, where, how do you, uh, what do you, what do you say to people who feel like, I just can't do it, I just, I wanna give up? I felt that way. And, and in uh, 2000, and so if the economy hadn't gone bust, I think that I probably would have been retired by 2011. Instead, I was basically starting over. And I was worse than over because when, every, when the bottom dropped out, I was actually $250,000 in debt. So I couldn't quit. I couldn't even just quit, right? I had to work to earn enough business to pay off that debt. And I remember the day I got back, I called it up to zero because I wasn't gonna quit before I was able to pay everybody I owed money to. And uh, the day I got up to zero, and I used to say all the time, when I get back to zero, I'm going to make a decision. You know, I'm either gonna go get a job, right? Get a job and pay some bills, or I'm going to keep moving. And uh, I decided to stay in the entrepreneurial field. The interesting thing is, uh, the, even the word entrepreneur is used all the time now, and it wasn't then. I was a small business owner. But what I feel like now is that in between 2000 and nine and 2011, I became an entrepreneur because I had to make things happen that were not going to happen unless I took some action. Before that, I was a small business. Business was coming in, business was going out. You know, the economy was growing and I was just doing what I knew to do. Being an entrepreneur is really what got me through that period and positioned me to really, and I, I keep saying me, I shouldn't say me so much because it's a team, even when I was, uh, no one was being paid, but really positioned us, us to establish uh, a real foundation. It really isn't about, my friends who are the smartest people I know are not the most successful people I know. It really is the people who are really willing to d grind, just do what has to be done no matter what it is. Um, those are the people who really are going to be the most successful over time. So when you, got, when you got below zero and you're looking to get back to zero, then you get back to zero, why didn't you get a job? Why did you make the decision to continue on as a small business owner? Um, a lot of reasons. I loved employing people. I couldn't find anyone to pay me $300,000 for not working all that hard. Um, I just felt like uh, the energy landscape was, was right. I felt like it was just the right time. And um, when things were working before 2009, it was such a high, establishing your own culture, being able to pay people good salaries, uh, determining where you want it to be, um, not just in business, but in a certain space, you know, what space you want to be in, just in the environment, in the world. There's something so attractive and compelling 
about, about being your boss, managing your own destiny, being the captain of your own ship, however you want to say it. it it's really attractive. The other thing is I felt like I knew enough. I had learned so much in the struggle of, uh, of not dying <laughs> that uh, I, I felt stronger. I was really exhausted. I was very exhausted, but I felt like this was the right time. And timing really is important. Now, switching gears a, a whole lot, uh, a lot of people, I think, have business ideas. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think the first step is to turn that, that idea into a real business? Um, you have to have someone who will pay for it. You know, there are a lot of great ideas, but it has to be an idea that people will pay for. I know several businesses right now that are struggling because they haven't been able to get the right combination of, uh, that will make people say, oh, you know, because when we see something that we want, a lot of things go through our head. One is, hmm, is this as good as, you know, some other product, can I make that? You know, depending on who you are, all kinds of things come into your head. And uh, you have to dispel all of those to get someone to actually buy it, number one, and number two, buy it from you. Because unless it's just a really unique product, they have options uh, for other places to buy it. So if you can't figure out how to get someone to pay more, significantly more, than it took for you to make it, then you keep your day job until you can figure that out. So the, the, you know, we, we use the term business model so you, loosely, but that is really one of the most important things. How are you going to make money from this? Uh, people say all the time, do your passion. Do something you're passionate about and you'll never work hard in your life. No, you can be very passionate and very broke. If you're in business to make money, uh, it's wonderful if you love what you're doing. But if you do something that you hate, but people want to pay a whole lot of money for it, you don't have to do it for as long. <laughs> so. And how do you think people should figure that out? Because we've all, we're all biased. Like, you know, if I love, uh, I don't know, chocolate chip cookies or something, I think, oh, everybody's going to love these. Absolutely. And they may love chocolate chip cookies, but look at how many people make chocolate chip cookies, right? And look at all the price points for chocolate chip cookies. Can you get yourself into that market and sell your cookies to the right people for the price that you'll feel good about, you know, the price that's going to make it, make it profitable. We, as entrepreneurs, we're very passionate about a lot of things, and we think whatever we did is like the greatest. And when I tell you how many times people have said, nobody else is doing this, you don't know. I mean, you don't know who else is doing it or trying to do it, right? So if you invest in something, you have to make sure people are willing to pay for it. And there's so many bloggers out there because fashion is their passion or whatever, hunting's their passion. Or you don't make money on your passion unless you can distinguish yourself in some way to make people want to buy that purchase, make that purchase from you. I might already know the answer to this one, but what was your most, ex most stressful experience as a business owner? Uh, the same period when I became an entrepreneur. I literally, in 2008, my two sons went to college. So I had twins in college, $70,000 a year. That does not include, you know, all the other things that students nowadays need that we didn't have when I was in college. But um, my 401k went down. Um, my business went to negative numbers. And I could not possibly let my husband know how much debt I was in. So I literally, um, I, I, when I say it was a dry mouth period, I mean, I remember just being totally stressed out and not being able to let anyone in my family know how bad things really were. That was, uh, that was the worst period. And the longer it went on, the more debt I was in. I mean, we were literally, every credit card, every possible place that I could find money. But remember, during that time, people, uh, companies were actually canceling our credit lines as well. So I would get a letter that said, you know that $100,000 credit line that you had? Uh, it's zero now. You have no credit with us. The other thing is, once you started paying your loan off, then the maximum 
you know, your, your credit score is based on how much space you have, right? How much capacity you have. Well, once they bring your capacity down to what you, then your credit score drops. So everything was bad at the same time. And my mother was ill in 2008. So it was uh, incredibly, I can't, it, epic, uh, an epic level of stress. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds crushing. How, how did you handle it? I wish I could say um, with grace, <laughs> but I'm sure I was a bitch. <laughs> I'm sure I was. You know, I, I really felt like I was in like gladiator mode the whole time. I was ready to fight just about anyone. And, and I, was, uh, I was bitter because I'd been out here for a long time. I felt like I'd done things the right way. My house was worth nothing, you know? So even the traditional places that you would borrow, Nobody I knew had money. Forget me having it. No one had it that I knew. So uh, sometimes in life, you just have to get through. You just have to get on the other side of whatever, um, you know, whether it's tragedy, pain, whatever it is. And I was just trying to get on the other side. I wish I could say that I prayed a lot and God helped me through it. What I will say is God got me through it. I didn't pray a lot. I didn't pray a lot, but he got me through it anyway. Well, that's, that's good that you made it out and, uh, and things are going well now. We are going to open it up for audience questions. Uh, so if you have a questions, uh, Nick's got the mic over there. And you can hop up and make a little line over there and, and ask your questions. Line. Matt, this might be a chance for you to, to get uh, some questions answered. <laughs> Thanks for speaking us, uh, to us tonight. Um, my question is, you spoke about um, the culture you came from, the, the um, tensions that were out there, the biases that were out there. In corporate world, it was certainly there, especially in your industry. Do you still feel, as an entrepreneur, that there's still those conflicts or are they lessened because you're an entrepreneur or are they kind of exaggerated because you're an entrepreneur uh, could you kind of speak to your views on that so um, I think that bias is so individual that you can't say that a particular company or situation but people have natural biases that are um, no fault of their own. It's just the lens that they view things through. And uh, one of the things that uh, I was talking with one of my, um, well, my vice president of uh, my, my COO about was that, so we have uh, some positions, we have energy auditors, we have technicians, and then we have engineers. And our engineers um, make 90, they start at 90 to $120,000 for the projects that we're on. And I have to feed minorities into that pipeline. And I am comfortable with that because I know that that's what I have to do. Because the typical engineer that's going to walk in your door is a white male, period. So I have to reserve spaces for those. Now, once I do that, I send a black female or someone of Asian descent. If the interviewer is white, and this is my personal observation, their bias actually comes through even in the interview. And I'll give you a perfect example. We just hired a black female who has a master's in chemical engineering. You know how bad this sister is? She has a master's in chemical engineering. And the very professional woman who interviewed her comments was she cannot fit in because she does not understand energy efficiency. I asked her some questions about energy efficiency and she didn't understand. This is a damn chemical engineer. I'm sorry, you all. And you think she can't understand energy efficiency? What would make you think that, right? I train people with GEDs to understand energy efficiency. But in her mind, that was a barrier. So we have to be really intentional um, 
break these barriers down, unfortunately, experience by experience and by experience, because I would never call her racist. I would never call her racist. But her purview is just very different than, uh, I, I don't think she would have ever looked at a, a white male chemical engineer and said, he doesn't understand energy efficiency. It wouldn't happen. So those, uh, those, those things are still there. And until, and I won't even say until, as more people realize the value of diversity in everything, uh, we're gonna get better, but it's a slow, laborious process for those of us who are waiting to get access. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Hello, uh, my Hi. name is Tops, and I actually wanted to ask a couple questions about your views in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I know earlier you mentioned that your passion was money. Mm. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and, uh, and you did say that you had few plants in the field you're currently in, energy. What are your views on something outside energy? Since you do like money, you like entrepreneurship, uh, what, what are your views and what would you tell someone who's starting a business in a different field? Um, as I said, the, view, the uh, things that matter in life matter in business. People like to do business with people who support their products and services, people who have integrity, people whose intent is long-term versus just making a sale. Um, I, I tell people all the time that business is life. The same things are important. The, um, as an entrepreneur, though, you really have to be prepared to work harder than you ever worked for, for any company. Because if you, don't, if you don't make it happen, no one just knocks on your door, looks you up in the paper, you know, or the uh, internet, and says, oh, I think I'll use this chimney sweeper, right? That happens very rarely, that they're going to select you. So uh, the work ethic that I see that's required and the ability to really reach out and collaborate with other people is incredible. The other thing, though, is that there's so many things that need to be done. One of the reasons there's so much opportunity in Detroit is that there's so many things missing in Detroit, right? So if you can just figure out what people need, you know, what people are willing to pay for and where, that's 90% of it. No matter what you start your business in, your product or service is going to um, need to change as the situation changes. One, someone asked me, what is a green business, right? Because now energy efficiency, renewable energy is a big deal. Any business is a green business because if you sold paint before, now you're selling paint with no volatile organic compounds, right? Now you're selling paint that uh, doesn't pollute, you know, the, the storms, the sewer systems. Now you're selling, you're right? So you adapt whatever product or service you have to whatever's going on in the environment, and that's the most important thing, agility, uh, vision, and being able to make the adjustments that, that are required to stay on top. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, that was such a long answer to a short <laughs> question. Uh, so one question I had for you was, um, I know energy is a really long tail uh, field to be in, so you know the sales cycle is extremely long. Um, how do you recommend to small business owners to start getting capital to start getting some of those larger sales and things like that? Because I know that they can take you know years, if not mm -hmm. you know decades, to get some of these contracts. It can take uh, years to get a contract, but there. Are, so the good thing about the business that we're in is. Uh, Energy services is a much shorter cycle, right? If I was manufacturing equipment, some of the equipment takes 30, 30 weeks to manufacture or 50 weeks. But I'm doing energy audits. We're service oriented. So one point is, it's so much easier to make money on a service, okay? If you can find a service, you can set your own price. The better the service is, the higher the price, and you don't have the same manufacturing cost. The problem is your service has to be really good and you have to stand by it for the long haul, unlike some of the products. Um, energy is everything from a technician doing air sealing and insulation, which I can order that today and he's out tomorrow, right? To, you know, manufacturing a fuel cell. So it's a 
huge, you know, it's a really broad um, business to be in. But again, the thing about energy is that it affects every other, every other business, not just the end product, the manufacturing product, the, you know, the process and, uh, and, and the view. So I can't remember what the question was anymore, but. More about the, about the like, long tail, like how do you. Oh, financing, yeah. The, the best way to, uh, to get, you know, they say the best way to predict the future is to, is to make it. To, the best way to predict the future is to create it. The best way to get money is to have money. There's, that's like the number one way. And isn't that crazy? But it's the truth. The better off you are financially, the easier it is to get money. So the most important thing to do is to show people, be able to show definitively how you're going to get money. You don't have to have money. If they believe, if you have your business case, your business model, such a way that, that the people that you're presenting to would buy it, and buy it not once, but buy it for their friends, buy it over and over again. It really is the best way to get money. Just show people how they're gonna get their money back. Uh, there are very few grants in business. Every now and then you'll win a pitch competition and someone say, here's $50,000, right? That is every now and then. The best way to get money is to show people how you're gonna get them their money back and maybe even a little more. Even people who aren't investing you as a person, right? They don't have a profit motive. They're just gonna lend you the money at zero interest. They still want it back. So that really is it, that's the key. Identify how you're going to get that money and more. And, and it's not fair, you know? I, I, uh, you know, I have this little, a little bit of this angry black woman thing in me. And it's annoying to me that now that my business is doing well, I have people trying to collaborate with me, people offering me money. Where were you guys a year and a half ago? Where were you when I went to the bank and you just said no? You know, you didn't say position yourself this way or do this or change this or tweak this. You said no. But it, it's just a fact. The best way to get money is to, to have money. Unless you know me. I, no, I'm just <laughs> So I've got two questions before we wrap up here. One is, do you think you should have started your business earlier in life? I think that things happen the way they're supposed to happen. I know that sounds really uh, weird now. And my 42-year-old self that started the business would never have said that. I think that the experiences that I had the last two years in corporate America, they were so difficult but they also gave me the drive that I needed to start a business that I really believed would not fail. You know, that determination, that experience helped forge who I am right now. Now, if I could start a business knowing what I know now, 15 years ago, oh, hell yeah. I would love to have started it earlier, but not based on what I knew at the time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the last question is, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be remembered for, this sounds so trite. I just want to be remembered for being a good person. I want to be remembered for trying to do the right thing, not just for myself, but for other people. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, we appreciate you coming here. Thank you.